the past couple of years, the CDC has been studying surveillance systems related to vision and eye health problems. With one publication recently released, they expect a number of other issu others issued in the coming months. Dr. Paul Lee, co-chair of the committee that worked on this effort, is joining us to share their progress. Dr. Lee is the F. Bruce Freilich Professor of Ophthalmology, the director of the Kellogg Eye, Kellogg Eye Center, and chair of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Michigan. Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Osley, and thank all of you for the opportunity to be here with you, and especially to all of our colleagues who, as the last question, talked about do the actual hard work of working with all of our fellow citizens and residents of this country. And I think it's uh, something that we need to be reminded of, which is we don't know what we don't know. And so spreading the net, and Dr. Fisher, you and Dr. Sevi are to be congratulated for taking an innovative approach to this entire area. Before I get started, just uh, disclosures, the comments today reflect those of myself as a personal uh, participant, not those of the organizations I'm fortunate to be associated with. And I do consulting on socioeconomics and health services research for the uh, companies listed. And I am one of the fortunate ones that have a little bit of health services funded from the NEI. You've heard today some wonderful talks at the very outset about the problems we have, about the growth and the prevalence of major chronic eye diseases and the economic impact by Dr. Frick. You've just heard also a wonderful innovative plan on what we could do to bend the curve on those prevalence numbers and thereby change the cost figures. And so the topics today are going to highlight the issues that we face as well as some approaches to begin to address this. This is truly an optimistic time, and you might say, how can you say that with all of the economic issues that we face in the government, with all of the numbers of people they're going to need care, there are workforce issues, there are issues about quality of care that Cynthia talked about in Access. Well, it's in those times of crises that we can actually get major paradigmatic changes made. And so that's why I'm entirely optimistic about what the next 10 years are going to bring. Because as Dr. Fisher showed us in his slides, who would have thought we'd have gene therapy? Who would have thought we'd be able to grow eyes or portions of eyes in laboratory dishes? Or to have imaging techniques that could give us resolution down to the cellular level in eye structures inside the eye? So there's an amazing opportunity ahead of us to go ahead and change the way we do things. If we take a couple steps back, we need to ask ourselves, we're all here because we're committed, but why should everybody else care who's outside of vision? We're fortunate to have Dr. Albright who runs the diabetes program in the CDC, and she's here because she's interested in diabetes and the eye and the public health of this country. But why should the typical person care? Well, it turns out that as we get older, as you saw in the first talk, almost all of us, if we live long enough, will have one of the major eye conditions. On the left, you'll see that for people, if you take a snapshot of people who enter in Medicare at any one time, so follow that same cohort from age 65 to 100 something over eight years. By the time they die or if they're still alive at eight years, almost half of them will have diabetic retinopathy or diabetes eye disease, glaucoma, macular degeneration, or some combination. If you throw in refractive error and cataract, pretty much everybody's going to have an eye condition. So all of us, since we all hope to live long, will have an eye problem. The second, as Kevin talked about in his talk, and as our colleagues around the world have shown, vision care is not only cost effective, but in certain analyses, as was done in Australia, actually is cost savings from an economic perspective for a society. So we can actually improve the economic well-being of our society by providing good eye care. In this country, our government and our society has agreed that vision is an important societal objective. So it's encapsulated in the Healthy People 2020 goals. How many folks out there know about and follow the Healthy People 2020 goals and objectives? So this is a room where it's talking to the choir. So I'll skip through these relatively quickly. You're probably more familiar with these in many respects than even I may be. But really it's to improve the vision health of 
the United States through a variety of techniques, starting with prevention all the way through to rehabilitation. So what are the current 2020 objectives? When you go through this, you'll see a few themes. The first is to increase the proportion of preschool children who get vision screening. That, I know, is an objective of PBA as well. But there's also a goal to actually reduce blindness and visual impairment. So it's not just to get people seen, but to actually make sure that we have a reduction in the numbers and rates of people who have vision loss. We also want to reduce, reduce or prevent occupational eye injuries and eye trauma. The adult population, we have the same goal of increasing the use of regular eye care, including dilated eye exams, as well as to reduce injuries, because those are entirely preventable, and also to improve vision rehabilitation. There is also the goal of reducing visual impairment, the rates at which visual impairment occur across five major conditions. So if we take a look at organizing these into a couple themes, one is reducing trauma, another is improving low vision rehabilitation, but the others can be organized into two major areas. One is the utilization of eye care services. The other is to reduce visual impairment. And if you look at the goals, they're roughly reductions of 10% in rates. Nice goals, not audacious goals. So I think the challenge for us is, can we not only meet Healthy People 2020, but can we fundamentally change it in major directions? If we could come up with a cure or prevention, rates go to zero, provided we get the treatment out to the people. I think that's Dr. Owsley's point in regards to funding a overall approach to care, is that we have to make sure that care gets to people, not just that it's available. We're fortunate, if we say, how are we going to accomplish this, that we actually have a model from our public health colleagues who've often labored in the wilderness for the last 50 years. And now is the time, on a population basis, to look at the techniques that our public health colleagues have that can help all of us in meeting our goals. One is the techniques used in public health surveillance. I am not a public health person or epidemiologist by trading, so I apologize in advance if I've gotten some of these concepts wrong. I'm sure, hopefully, you'll correct me afterwards. But really, public health surveillance, as exemplified by what the CDC does, is to collect data in a systematic manner, to look at that data, to use that data for planning, for implementation, and then to reevaluate how well the implementation has gone so that we can try to prevent or control conditions of interest. So Dr. Osley alluded to a CDC panel that Dr. West and I had the privilege of being co-chairs on. And you could recognize from the attendees that we had an international panel of really top-notch folks from around the United States, from different perspectives, from optometry, from ophthalmology, from a variety of areas, to look at the aspects of what it would take for the application of public health surveillance principles towards meeting some of our goals as a society and what it would take to be effective in creating a surveillance system so that this can happen. In surveillance, there are three major functions. One is to monitor the current status of conditions and to track risk factors as well as aspects of problems. To use that to help prioritize our work especially for key problems and key groups, as well as to help us allocate resources, and then to evaluate how we're doing. So let's take a look at some of the classic target populations. In vision, as in the rest of healthcare, there are target populations by age, by race and ethnicity, by gender and sex, by socioeconomic status and geographic regions, rural, urban particularly. These are well-known axes of disparities in care and availability and even in the prevalence of visual impairment. These don't stand in isolation. These stand in relation to the healthcare delivery system we have. And the right is work that's 20 years old from the managed care era in Southern California, 
where we looked at the rates of cataract surgery in fee-for-service compared to two forms of prepaid health care. What's striking is the rates of cataract surgery go down by 50% in the prepaid care systems. And then the prepaid care systems, that change is borne almost entirely by women. And so when we have these sort of interactions of the healthcare financing system with the disparities and the delivery system we have or have had in the past and may be revisiting in the future, it has additional impacts on some of the issues that we're concerned about today. Dr. Munoz already talked about the aging U.S. population and some data from an earlier version which shows that the growth in the numbers and rates of people with visual impairment, and in this case, specific ocular diseases, go up substantially, especially amongst our oldest old, and especially amongst our minority populations, particularly blacks and, and uh, Latinos. So if we want to create a surveillance method, the panel expressed its opinion that we really need to have valid endpoints and groups of interest to have ways of collecting the data and then to feed that data in a usable format to all of you in the private sector, in the not-for-profit sector, in the professional societies, in the public health agencies, to hospitals and health systems, to begin to use that information to change the way we do things by implementation efforts to actually try to improve care and to reduce the rates of visual impairment, and then to collect data on a regular basis to see how we're doing. Most folks here have probably engaged in continuous quality improvement, the PDA cycle, plan, do, assess. This is not rocket science. It's doable for all of us. The panel felt very strongly that this is something not only that we should do, but can do. And so on the left, you see the typical PDA, CQI, TQM cycle, where you collect data, analyze data, you send it out to people, people make changes, then you assess the impact of changes. I'd like to thank John Cruz and the CDC for creating this diagram. And then on the right side, you actually see the additional feature is that we can make our metrics better parallel with this so that we can come up with better measures of our success. So if we want to go ahead and look at what the features of a surveillance system might look like, we would want to have some standard definitions. It turns out that many of the folks in this room were on a panel uh, almost a decade ago for the Social Security Administration run through NAS and IOM defining disability. And it turns out the analyses show that disability at 2040, 2070, and 2200, our thresholds that we currently use, are basically arbitrary slash traditional cut points we've chosen. That disability measured through contrast or visual acuity is a linear relationship. And so it's up to us as a society to say, these are our thresholds because that's what we want to cover. And then we need to work with the people who actually make changes. So let's look at reducing visual impairment as some of the activities. First, the panel thought about a lot of potential indicators that we can have for success and settled on visual acuity and contrast sensitivity as the indicators for this first generation approach. There are a lot of other options that we can have that have a lot of advantages but they also aren't as well developed, and we don't have standardization, and more importantly, we don't have acceptance on their use on something as important as a surveillance system. So visual impairment was thought to be the key for the surveillance system, not disease, because visual impairment is the final common pathway impact of all of these conditions. So visual acuity with standardized definitions probably at 2040, 2070, and 2200. 2040 and 2070 because they reflect important policy decisions made by our society in relationship to driving and other important privileges. Because of the importance of listening to patients and patient-reported or patient-centered care, the panel also expressed its opinion that we want to capture the patient's perception or the individual's perception of how they're doing. 
And that's why all the quality of life questionnaires, uh, Kevin's nice work from NEPS, looking at the patient expression of how they're doing is really important because it's complementary to our traditional measures. There's need for harmonization of the questions, better understanding of them, but it's enough that the panel expressed its opinion that it's something we would want to collect. There's a lot of exciting work on actually observing how people perform. Those of you who saw the gene therapy uh, tapes for labors actually saw the obstacle course at the University College of London. Those are really important techniques that we can begin to use in the future. Where can we get the information? This is a major point because we can't have a continuous cycle without having the data to see how we're doing. Traditionally, the examination portion has come out of the NHANES, but that examination component was discontinued in 2009. There's a vision supplement in the National Health Interview Survey, but again, that's more of a survey as opposed to an actual examination. So we need to look at methods of creating the data collection that we need to monitor our progress. Utilization of services. There have been a lot of comments in, made about whether or not and how people use care services. I'm certainly looking forward to Dr. Albright's presentation to sort of synthesize everything that we're talking today. We know regular eye care is really important because if we look at a representative sample of the American population amongst our older population, we know that the more often we have regular eye exams, the less likely people are to develop limitations in intermediate activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living, bathing, clothing, washing, really important aspects. We also know that insurance is important, that the rates of utilization vary by insurance status in this country. This is work done through the CDC uh, by uh, Dr. Zag and colleagues, including Dr. Cruz and Dr. Sedin, looking at the different rates of utilization in the United States for eye care services by the kinds of insurance people have. Dr. Owsley and others have done really great work in understanding why people don't use eye care services. And in her paper, she identified five or six major themes, one of which I've highlighted for us to consider, which is the issue of trust. A lot of the literature that's been out there on access to care and use of care have not looked at this really critical issue. And we know in this country this may underlie a significant portion of the racial and ethnic disparities because this is data from a poster from the general internist 15 years ago that showed that in a survey, blacks express much more distrust of the motives of their physicians, whether they're optometrists or ophthalmologists or however we define their care providers. So how can we measure utilization of eye care? There are data sources that are already used in Healthy People 2020. We're fortunate that there are other data sources that we can tap into, claims data, ARC data sets that Kevin and others have used, as well as national health surveys. The utilization piece, we could get a handle on using these alternate mechanisms. Measuring the actual visual impairment is going to require some form of measurement system, whether it's continuation of the NHANES examination or some format, or can we tap into electronic health records with the national meaningful use? There are ongoing efforts for patient registries that may help form some sort of function, but those are patient-based systems. They're not nationally representative population systems. You know, we talked about innovation. People have found that looking at queries for the flu in the Google search system actually are good track very well with CDC data on flu spread around the country. So maybe there's something we could do along those lines, something that would be innovative. And certainly claims data with a nine month lag with the greater detail coming up in ICD-10 may allow us to figure out what's going on. But again, that doesn't have the actual measurement of visual acuity. And then a couple comments and then I'll close. And that is we need to engage the care system. And that's not just traditional doctor's offices, it's everyone who's involved. You talk, Kevin talked about the informal care system, PBA with its affiliates, works very well in getting out to the communities and working with people. It really is to create an enterprise approach with the surveillance system as one of its key pillars. 
In terms of innovation, we don't need to limit ourselves to what we do in the United States. If we look at the models in Africa that Beatrice and Sheila West do in trachoma care with what they do in India, we have lots of really effective models that reach more people at lower cost than what we do in the United States. And so whether it's an Aravin model for having telemedicine and buses and having some subsidies of care for the poor by the people who could afford to have cataract surgery by having really efficient cataract surgery, or the LV Prasad model where we have different levels of care in different geographic areas. We have little town and village clinics run by trained health workers with the elementary school education all the way up to a tertiary center. These are all models that already exist. They're innovative in the sense that we haven't applied them here, and they have the advantage they've actually been tested, and we know how they work. And so going forward, we have a few other research and work agenda issues. You know, we talked about getting some better standardization of our patient-related, patient-reported outcomes questions, but really it's to be innovative, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to be here with you because if we can end up with this kind of system where surveillance plays a key role in creating a system, we can actually meet and exceed our goals for Healthy People 2020. And so the CDC actually has a strategic plan almost a decade ago, it's been seven years I think, where there's a role and a framework for everyone in vision to work together to achieve what we want to do by reducing some of the duplication and improving the collaboration and enhancement. So with that, you know, I think Hugh Taylor said it best, that I care for the future is organized on some very simple principles and that we can really meet not only Healthy People 2020, but also the bigger audacious goals that we just heard referenced. Thank you all very much, happy to take questions.